How often do you update your decks? For me, since I rotate my decks so often, I usually update the best of the best once each year, once all of the releases for the year are out. This also gives me the opportunity to reflect on some of my decks and whether they worked, whether they were fun, or whether they needed something more. So join me as I break down some of the why for revisiting decks, and in my opinion, what we should be looking at when it comes to giving your decks a good, honest try before letting them stagnate or writing them off completely. Now, let's break down what my criteria for a deck update is, and I typically have three reasons why I revisit a deck. First is that the deck was a blast to play. This is likely where a lot of people fall. The deck was fun, and good, and worked, so it's time to see what new goodies can be added to it. These are what I call forever decks, ones that I love so much I will never take them apart. This is my Too Many Guy Rudas clones deck, or my Brudiclad Telcor Engineer tokens deck, the ones that deserve the tender loving care to work at peak capacity. These are your favorite decks, and while I may really look at these once a year, these are decks where you may be looking at them each and every set, wondering what one to two cards could be a possible fit. These are going to be decks where you've already tweaked and tuned them to the point where the only reason you may add another card is that a new one has been printed that is perfect for the deck's concept, or is a direct upgrade to a card you already had in a list. Which means, unfortunately, that these are also the decks that are the hardest to update, because every card in them is precious. You have a longing attachment, because either they served you well in a game in the past, or you have a special printing. Or maybe the card was a trade with a friend and you want to remember it fondly. But if you want to keep your favorite decks fresh and exciting, an update is necessary. With thousands of new cards released each and every year, unless you want your deck to be a snapshot of specific spaces in time for magic, you need to assess what new cards work in your list. The second criteria for a deck update is a deck that didn't work and let me down. These are also brews that get played once or twice but ultimately get taken apart. But these may also be the decks where you want to make the concept work, and if you're anything like me, you want to tinker with the list until it can successfully do the thing. These are disappointments, like my Emodane the Pyrohammer deck, where finding the right balance between all of the elements proved difficult in practice versus in theory. It's possible to make these decks work, but require some serious thought and consideration. These may also be the decks where the concept was great in theory, but in practice ended up being boring, like my Sithis Harvest Hand deck. It may be fun for some folks, but the Enchantress theme was just not thrilling to me. There wasn't a challenge or a goal beyond enchantment synergies, and it left me wanting more from the deck. And that may be the mood these decks leave you in, but that's the struggle. These are the hardest to return to and revisit because the desire might not be there to improve the deck. You may have already written off these lists and find no real reason to better them or put them back together once taken apart. But in my opinion, these are always decks worth a tune-up. You may end up missing out on your future favorite deck by not revisiting a failure, and by at least being prepared to try anything again, it means you can be confident in your claims that the deck just isn't for you as long as you've given it an honest try. The third criteria for a deck revisit is what I call the Goldilocks scenario, where a new card is printed that is so perfect for a deck that you had already built that you cannot resist going back to that deck for another try. This is Agatha's Vile Cauldron being printed which fits perfectly into the Tazri All Activated Abilities deck, being a single card that not only fits well in the deck, but also ups the power so significantly that you can't mention the commander without the card in the same breath. Or this may be an entire sub-theme, like the food synergies that came from the Lord of the Rings set, giving new life to all the Guillaume Master Chef decks that people have where something is added so fundamental to a deck that it drives you to revisit it, make cuts, make adds, and in some cases completely rebrew an existing list. But these are contextual updates and need to be the right scenario, the right timing, and really the most viable. 
I call them a Goldilocks scenario for a reason. This is the timing and the cards that need to be just right for you to really be inspired to update a deck. With the why of deck updates covered, let's look at the how. This is on three basic scales, a full deck list overhaul, a specific package update, or a per card replacement. Here's an example of a full deck list overhaul, my Emodane the Pyrohammer deck. I got to play this brew with my friends over at Elder Dragon Hijinks, linked up top, but the brew really underperformed. The challenge is that the commander, the most consistent and reliable part of the deck, doesn't really do anything on her own. Emodane is an enhancer rather than an enabler. You already have to be doing the thing before she gets strong enough and is really useful. Her ability to take direct damage spells aimed at a single creature and turn them into damage for each opponent is really strong, especially when you add in doubling effects. But you already need to be doing damage to creatures, and there needs to be creatures in play to really work. Now, there were a few factors as to why the deck didn't work in the games that I played. First being that the games I played were really just low creature games. That limited the amount of targets I had, and I really didn't want to point any burn spells at my own creatures. The first place I'd look to update is just that, get some creatures I control in the deck that I'd be okay pointing burn spells at. Brash Taunter and Stuffy Doll are the big ones here. When I released this deck tech, everyone asked why they weren't in the list, and here I'll admit, your commander mechanic is not infallible. They should have been in the list to begin with, and in revisiting this deck, they are the first ads. The next point that really needed to be revisited is the fact that, for a burn deck, I really didn't have enough burn spells in the list. In playing the deck, I realized that. I just wasn't drawing burn spells. My whole thesis with the deck was that all you needed was one burn spell. And, with your damage multipliers and the way they work with multiple damage sources, one burn spell would be enough to end the game. So in brewing the deck, I went light on burn spells to the deck's detriment. In reality, you can win with a single burn spell and a few damage multipliers, but you need to draw those burn spells first. With your commander not being any kind of advantage engine, and Red's card draw being not the best, I ended up with fewer usable spells than I needed. The list focused too much on synergies and not enough on value baselines of cards I was playing. In the end, Cutting some of the on-cast trigger creatures like Electrostatic Field, Kessig Firebrand, and Erebor Flamespith could make the way for more burn spells. I'd add in Stone Splitter Bolt, Mind Collapse, and Shivan Meteor in their place just to name a few. And in playing the deck, I made a last-minute addition of the One Ring to shore up issues with no value or advantage outside of the command zone, and that ended up working wonders in a few ways. Who knew the One Ring was actually a very good card? It is okay if your decks don't work sometimes. The challenge is whether you want to give them another try or not. In this case, I'd likely consider other options for the deck and keep Emodane as a staple in the 99 rather than a dedicated commander. Not that she doesn't do the thing, but rather that I would want something in the command zone that helps the thing happen. A commander that draws cards or does the thing on their own is much more reliable than a commander that only comes down when it's time to win. When it comes to an example of a specific package overhaul, I look to the recent example of my Brudeclad Telcor Engineer deck. This is a deck that I built earlier this year, but quickly became one of my favorites, built around making token copies of the best artifacts or creatures on the board, and then making, like, a hundred of them. See the original brew linked up top. But recently, I found there were some awkward parts of the deck, specifically around one package, the Orvar the Allform and Vesuvan Duplomancy package. See, I had compromised the deck around these two cards that copy permanents targeted by spells. I had included cards like Argent Mutation, Suit Up, and Whim of Volrath just to interact with these cards, which means if I drew them on their own without Orvar or Duplomancy out, these cards were just fancy cantrips. There were times when this did work though, don't get me wrong, but just as many times where it didn't do anything. I kept track, and I was literally 50-50 on these cards being any good at all. To put it another way, the value ceiling on them, their highest potential, was very high, but the value floor on them, their baseline utility, was very low. What I ended up doing was taking out Argent Mutation and Suit Up, 
I left in Whim of Volrath because the ceiling on it was just so high, it ended up being one of the three that really skewed the numbers positively at all. I replaced them with Quantum Misalignment and Sea Double, two spells that also targeted creatures and met the necessity of the removed cards, but on their own also provided the core utility of the deck in making token copies of creatures. What this has done is allowed the deck's core concept to stay intact and more concise and more consistent with just a two card change. But that's not all for this brew, as I also adjusted some of the creatures. My girl, Rionia Fire Dancer, is one of my favorites, but in a deck with only about 20 instants and or sorceries, she was very inconsistent in her copy making being worth five mana. Sure, you get one temporary token each turn minimum, but that wasn't fast or good in the end. Same can be said about Mirage Phalanx. The best case scenario with Mirage Phalanx was making a bunch of other Mirage Phalanxes and parrying them all with each other. But even then, at 6 mana and one of the higher costed creatures in the deck, it ended up being lackluster next to the likes of Ancient Copper Dragon. And then there's the Peregrine Dynamo. I had this in the deck because there are a lot of legendary creatures in the 99, but really not as many as really mattered. Like with the Orvar package, the Dynamo just did nothing if not paired with a non-commander legend. I felt like the floor on this guy was just too low to matter at all. So what did I replace them with? First, Schema Thief. This was a consistent way to make copies of my opponent's artifacts. Even if I just nab a soul ring, it means that I can turn all of my tokens into soul rings, which is, let me check my notes, mm, ah, just as I thought, very good. But even just regularly getting another token each turn meant turning all of my tokens into a copy of Schema Thief doubled my board size every turn. It's everything this deck wants for consistency. Second, the new Sahili the Sun's Brilliance made it into the list. Another cheap way to make a token of a creature or artifact, Sahili is a perfect fit for the deck's concept. She's a token starter for Brutoclad nonsense. Yet another way to create the first copy of something to turn all of your tokens into. Lastly, I added Dano DNA. With the deck's core concept being to make copies of your opponent's stuff, this had to make the list. It's a mimic vat that's more controllable and more permanent. It also makes for some great stories when you exile a Birds of Paradise with it to run over your opponents with an army of 6-6 six, six flying trampled dinosaur Birds of Paradise. I am very happy with this inclusion. Now for the third example of the Cinderella Clause, the Cinderella Replacement, a card so perfect you simply cannot avoid their addition to your list. For this, I cite my pride and joy, too many Gyrudas. With the Doctor Who universes beyond, they release not one but two even mana value clones for the deck. That's what this deck needs, and with every even mana value clone they print, moves the deck closer and closer to inevitability on a single Gyruda trigger. I needed to make room for these two cards. For what to replace, it came to some difficult choices. Each card in the list is precious to me because I've taken the time to foil out the deck. But in the end, I went with the higher costed cards to replace first. This left Right of Replication and Conjurer's Closet on the cutting room floor. A shame, but a definitive upgrade with more clones. And just recently with the printing of The Roaming Throne, I knew I immediately needed to find room in the deck for it. I already run Panharmonicon, with everything in the deck entering as Gyruda, naming Demon or Kraken with the throne essentially made it another Panharmonicon that I could flip with Gyruda. This left me with the difficult choice to cut Mirror Gallery. It's the most expensive of the legend rule-breaking enablers, and with the increased density of clones in the deck, became the least necessary inclusion and got cut. Now I can say I'm very happy with every card in the deck, and if you want to see every card in the deck, check out the video linked up top. And if you want to pick up some of the cards mentioned today, or any cards to update your decks, check out my sponsor Face to Face Game. One of the largest retailers in Magic Singles and Sealed product, you can use my code MECHANIC right now to save 5% on your order. If you want to check out the updated deck list for these brews, you can head over to my sponsor Moxfield. Moxfield is the best deck building platform in the world and makes it easy to see revisions with their in-depth history feature. Visit my profile today and don't forget to follow while you're there. Don't forget to check out these other videos on the channel about deck building and if you were inspired today, you have to hit that subscribe button. But 
as always, folks, good luck and have fun.